electric vehicles and renewable energy sources are entering their boom era. Some estimates suggest that American power transmission will need to double in capacity in order to meet demand in the coming decade. The construction of an expanded energy grid is going to require a lot of raw minerals, metals, and a surprising commodity, lumber. The granddaddy product of them all in the woods is utility poles. The EV era is going to need a lot of trees. And if you think somebody can just go out into a forest and pick any pine tree for a utility pole, think again. You know, there's probably only like going to be a half dozen or so on an acre that could be a pole. I'm Anissa Khalifa. On this episode of The Broadside, we take a trip to the forest and track the utility pole boom happening in the South. Hey, this is Anissa. I just wanted to take a moment to let you know that we can only do what we do with your support. That allows us to bring you original reporting every week about the stories that matter to you, about our home, this fascinating place that we live in. To support the show, go to this week's episode description and click the link, or go to wunc.org and click on the donate link in the upper right-hand corner. Thank you so much, and now let's get back to the show. You can't go far in North Carolina without coming across some pine trees. Firmly rooted in the South's pine belt, North Carolina's forests stretch across more than 18 million acres. But a lot of these trees already have somebody's name on them. Most of our forests in North Carolina, as you drive down the road, are actually privately owned forest land. This is Robert Barden. He's a professor and extension specialist at NC State's College of Natural Resources in Raleigh, North Carolina. We have over 500,000 landowners that own forest land in the state, and that is mostly owned as private lands. We're not talking federal government, local government, or state government. These are private individuals that own forest land. Robert says all this forest provides big business for the state. Turns out money can grow on trees. So we're a very important state related to forestry. Here in North Carolina, uh, more than $35 billion economic impact uh, the forest sector, forest industry has on our state economy. It's quite large. There's very few uh, commodities that come close to that or even uh, supersede that. But only a fraction of that industry includes utility pole production. Robert recently took my colleague Charlie Shelton Ormond on a walk through a forest in the heart of Raleigh to talk more about our trees. This forest is used for educational purposes, bringing students here to teach them about forestry, but do you also harvest the trees to be used for other purposes? So the forest here uh, at Shank Forest, we do actively manage it. That includes harvesting and everything. So we try to manage this forest just like any other organization or private individual might be managing their forest. We do look to generate income off the forest that we then invest back into the management and care of the forest, plus the educational aspects. What is North Carolina's place within supplying utility poles from its pine supply? Do you see North Carolina as a major source for supplying these utility poles that seem to be increasing in their demand? Poles are a very uh, high-end product produced by our pine forests. Southern pines uh, in general are a species for producing pole trees. In a typical acre of forest land, it's a very small percentage of trees that actually end up as poles. It might be in an acre of land, 20 trees, uh, where we might be harvesting 120 trees when their final maturity In general, it's really a small percentage of the products that come out of the forest. The trees are rare. They have to be really big, really straight, not a lot of knots. That's Ryan December, a commodities reporter for The Wall Street Journal. He recently reported on the increasing demand for utility poles and the pressing need for more tall pine trees. You know, you can imagine, like, in a population of humans, like, how many are going to be, like, professional athletes or, like, NBA players. There's not that many out there that are like just the right shape and size. And so, you know, when you can find those, you get a premium from what, you know, a mill might pay you if they were going to cut that tree into two by fours or certainly pulp it into 
cardboard or whatever. So why are big trees like this such a hot commodity for the renewable industry? Why do they need them so much right now? So there's a few things going on. And one is just, you know, human nature is that we put up poles all over to do the first telegraphs in the 1800s and then telephones and power. And, you know, they need to be replaced. They don't last forever. They last several decades, but they don't last as long as a lot of them have been up in the ground. But along with that, we need a lot more power these days because of electric cars and computers and all our phones that we're constantly charging. And the the demand for power is just so much, it's more intense these days. And that means, you know, more wires. It means uh, bigger equipment like transformers and such. So the poles have to be bigger and stronger than they were in previous years, sort of the run of the mill pole. And that is meaning not only do we need a lot of poles, but we need a lot of bigger poles. As one executive told me, the trick is the standard pole for decades has been one size, and now the utilities want to size up one or two. And this guy was like, you know, here's the thing. The typical pole is that way because that's basically how trees grow. And the needs now, he said something like, God doesn't make a pole like that, you know. They have to find these giant trees and then kind of chop them down to size to meet the sort of stouter uh, specifications today that utilities want. You know, it, it's touched off this scramble to find, you know, sort of the perfect specimens. And there's concerns that there aren't enough of them to meet demand. One of the things that this makes me think of also is if you need such a specific size and part of the trunk of a tree, what happens to every other part of the tree? And is that a lot of waste as well? Is, is there like some conversation around that waste? Is it waste? Is that wood going to other uses? So if you go to a pole mill, a lot of times like they'll spin it on a big, it's sort of like peeling a carrot or something. It just spins around or a potato. And they spin it around and put these knives on it and they kind of sculpt it and smooth it out. And all the stuff, the bark and anything that's left over goes into a big pile of basically sawdust. And all that sawdust is taken and fed into a kiln that is sent to the big drying sheds where they dry these poles out so that they can then treat them with preservatives so that they last for decades. So the forest product industry broadly, they were really early on sort of using, you know, all the parts. And it really, back back when it started, it wasn't really like designed to be ecologically friendly or anything. It was just a source of cheap and abundant energy right on hand. And as one copper's executive told me, he goes, we weren't trying to be environmentally friendly when we started doing this. We were being cheap. <laughs> but of course, it's worked out that it definitely is a benefit to them in terms of when investors are looking to invest in businesses that they deem to be sustainable, that can navigate the new world where there might be regulations or customer preferences on sustainable products. So why are we even still putting power lines above ground? Why can't we just bury these power lines and then it would take away the need for these poles in the first place? Well, it would be incredibly expensive. Tremendously more expensive. And think about, like, now if there's a problem and you have to go and send, you know, a crew out to uh, repair a transformer or something, they pull up in a truck, climb up a ladder and do it. Imagine if you had to dig up a roadway. It is just so difficult to build an overhead power line. Imagine if you had to get permission to dig up everybody's property or right of way or cross roads. Um, and so it just is prohibitively expensive. You know, in big cities, you can do it. But to do it on a grand scale and over distance would just be just totally prohibitively expensive. You know, a lot of people might say, well, why are we cutting down trees to be green? Well, that's a good question. But, you know, also, if you cut down a 40-year-old pine tree and preserve it, that carbon that it's absorbed over the decades is going to be held in that wood until it is burnt or comes down in decays. So in a way, you can look at all those wooden poles and say those are little storage capsules for carbon. When we come back, we'll talk more with Brian about how one pole mill in Georgia is dealing with this rise in demand. AI chatbots parse information. Have you ever considered their romantic potential? 
In a new three-part series on love and AI from Embodied, we'll explore the intricacies of human-bot relationships, learn about the past, present, and future of sex robots, and meet people uploading conversations with their loved ones into software in hopes that it can help them grieve. New episodes drop each Friday in February, starting on the 9th. Subscribe and follow Embodied so you don't miss it. We're back with the broadside. So, Ryan, you went down to southeast Georgia and talked with some people in Vidaya who work at a copper's plant. Why did you choose this place specifically to spotlight? You know, Georgia's interesting. It's sort of, I, I tell people I'm in New York and, and the South is, is sort of a mystery to some folks, especially the rural South. And I sort of compare Georgia to what Texas is to oil, Georgia is to forest products. It's just a place where there's a lot of action in the woods. And you know, anybody who's ever driven through Georgia knows there's a ton of pine trees. Not that there's, you know, it's that different than, say, North Carolina, Florida, Alabama, all these places. What we generally call the Pine Belt, which runs from East Texas all the way, you know, up touching into Virginia. And that that was just a place where they had a lot of work going on. They had all systems go, basically. This is a company, Coppers, who is investing a lot in being able to ramp up production, you know, adding equipment at mills and things like that. And that was one mill where there was just work going on and orders coming in and we could get a good look at how a pole is made. So you're describing this demand for poles being so high for so many reasons, and yet the capacity for making them is too low right now. So what are the ways that pole mills are planning to alleviate some of this pressure? Like, are they thinking of solutions? Yeah, well, so a couple of years ago, the a trade group that represents pole makers said, well, Look, if you utilities want to go two sizes up from what was typical, that's a much bigger tree and there may not be enough of them. So maybe you could do more poles instead of bigger poles. Think of like a line that might have 50 giant ones. Maybe you could have 75, put them closer together to support that weight. Uh, Obviously, utilities probably aren't (laughs) really excited about that idea buying more and and redesigning things. There's also, you know, other materials. You know, there's a lot of money going into concrete poles. There's a firm that's building new factories to build composite, almost like a plastic, a fiberglass sort of thing. There's steel poles for like the biggest, the big transmission lines. There's things like that. There's other materials and there's companies that are looking at the situation saying, well, if they want poles that big, there's not enough. Mother Nature is not making them fast enough. So we can cut in and get some market share with our different materials, which, you know, they're going to be probably a lot more expensive, but they might have other qualities that make them preferable in certain uses to a wood pole. And in terms of these tree farms, are they changing the way that they farm these in any way? Or is it just such a long-term runway that there's nothing to be done at this point? There's some growers out there who will say, I want to grow poles. And they might plant longleaf pine, which was sort of the native species of the South. And they may specifically target that market, right? But there's not a ton of those. Usually, you plant your loblolly. They grow, and then you go through and say, okay, for whatever reason, these over here are big enough to be poles. These scraggly ones or crooked ones, they're going to the pulp mill. They're going to be Starbucks cups and beer boxes and Amazon delivery boxes. And then, you know, the ones in the middle are going to various sawmills to become two-by-fours and dimensional lumber. So there's not a ton you can do other than, you know, nowadays there's a lot of the genetics of these things, you know, sort of the old-fashioned breeding of plants to have certain characteristics over time. Uh, Those have gotten really advanced to where trees are growing faster, straighter, no branches until the very top. I call them the Dr. Seuss trees, you know, with with just a little bit of pine needles at top. And those are sort of intentionally planted and have been cultivated over time to have those features. So, you know, you could have a thing in the future where more trees are growing to suit the final use, whether it's lumber or poles. But you're still at the mercy of Mother Nature. As we're walking down the road here, uh, we have two different stands. They're both uh, pine trees. One stand is about 20 to 25 years old. Back in Raleigh, North Carolina, producer Charlie Shelton Ormond is in the woods with forester Robert Barden. And despite the serene setting and the gorgeous clear day, he can't ignore this utility pole pressure. 
Do you have any perspectives from your expertise about how to deal with this influx in demand for for these specific types of poles? It kind of seems like rock and hard place, right, where you want to increase this industry of renewable energy, but it demands a very specific tree, and there's only so many of those. With active management, landowners can end up producing a few more poles per acre on their property. If we rely on our natural pine forest to regenerate stands that are cut, they tend to have, we'll say, poor genetics. And so really for landowners that are interested in more intensive management, focusing on their higher quality sites, planting genetically improved tree seedlings, doing intermediate stand management will likely produce some more poles per acre than if they just let Mother Nature take the course. If you want to check out journalist Ryan December's reporting in the Wall Street Journal, we've dropped a link in this week's show notes. This episode of The Broadside was produced by Charlie Shelton Ormond. Our editor is Jared Walker. Special thanks to Dr. Robert Barden, Dr. Bob Apt, and the College of Natural Resources at NC State University. The Broadside is a production of WUNC North Carolina Public Radio. You can email us at broadside at wunc.org. If you enjoyed the show, leave us a rating, a review, or tell a friend to tell a friend. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll be back next week.